Well, welcome everyone. I'm Steve Bure. I am the president of Discovery Institute. Uh, it's great to see such a great crowd tonight uh, and a lot of new faces. Uh, this is an exciting evening for Discovery Institute as we launch our new Center for Civic Leadership. Um, I want to begin with a few housekeeping items. If you have a cell phone, if you can please turn it completely off so that it doesn't interfere with the recording equipment. Uh, speaking of that, I want to thank the Seattle Channel for being here. Uh, this will air on their network, and so um, I'm sure you can find it on their website and share it with your friends. Um, this is, like I said, an exciting night. This is uh, when we launch our Center for Civic Leadership. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, Representative Hans Zeiger, who's been a big help in putting this all together. Uh, the new center is a perfect fit for Discovery Institute, and there are a number of reasons for that, and it's a fit for me personally. I serve on the city council over in Newcastle, so I have an interest in civic leadership and involvement, and uh, for Discovery Institute, for a few obvious reasons. One, uh, our speaker tonight, Senator Gordon, is a friend and a mentor of mine. He also serves on the Discovery Institute Board of Directors. Uh, John West is a senior fellow and has written a book on, on the American founding. Uh, radio personality Michael Medved is a senior fellow. And last but certainly, certainly not least, uh, Bruce Chapman is the founder of Discovery Institute. He's right back there and um, chairman of our board. Uh, Bruce has a, his own storied 40-year career in public policy. And uh, you've got him beat by 10 years, Slate, I think. <laughs> Uh, but really a remarkable career as a C Seattle City Council member, Secretary of State, an appointee in the Reagan administration, and he's been a, a great mentor of mine as well. Uh, last but not least, we're, we're talking about uh, politicians, and Bruce has literally written the book on politicians. It's just not finished yet. <laughs> uh, it, we hope that that'll happen uh, sometime in the next year. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that Representative Hans Zeiger has been hugely helpful. A lot of the new faces that I see to, here tonight, I suspect, are, are related in some way to Hans's involvement, and I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, i introduce Hans briefly for those of you who don't know about him. He's a pretty remarkable young man, uh, 26 years old, recently elected the state, legislat state legislature representing the 25th district, uh, centered around Puyallup, where he was born and raised, and in fact, his family were pioneers in that area. Uh, he is a Hillsdale graduate and got a master's degree in public policy at Pepperdine University. Again, uh, won in a landslide uh, in 2010. <laughs> 30 votes, 30 votes. So every vote counts, and Hans is a proof of that. But he's also proof of someone who's really committed at a young age to be involved in the political process and a believer in civic leadership. So he's the perfect person to help out with this project. Uh, before I call him up, though, I want to share an experience that I had at Senator Gorton's office. Those of us, and there are a few of us in the room who've worked for Slade, uh, he's a remarkable man, but also uh, known for being very, very good to his staff. And uh, I had a great experience there. There was one time, though, I got a letter. And uh, I, I worked in the Bellevue office for Slade. I worked on foreign policy, immigration, and trade issues. And, um, and so really what I did, when I, I, I like to say I represented Slade in the community. Really, I answered constituent mail. That's, you start in the mail room, then you answer letters. So I, I got a, a letter one time from a person who was asking for Slade's help on an immigration issue. And anyone who's dealt with the Immigration Service knows that any federal bureaucracy is difficult. The Immigration Service seems particularly difficult. And, uh, and so I was unable to get an answer from them. And about two or three weeks later, I got a letter from the same constituent, and it, it said, Senator Gorton, I wrote you three weeks ago, and I have not heard back. And, and I'm trying to solve this immigration issue, completely unable, you need to do your job. Do your job, exclamation point, exclamation point. Signed, Hans Zeiger. <laughs> that is not a joke. That was in 1996, Hans was 11. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, he was active, you think he's young now, he was active at a really early age. So I'm thrilled to have uh, Hans involved with this project. 
Uh, he's uh, been a great help again, and I, wel I would ask you to welcome Hans Eicher. When uh, Steve said that my election was a landslide, uh, Slade said, it really was a landslide compared to uh, Mitt Romney in Iowa. <laughs> 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 um, the next generation of leaders faces huge challenges. How to be good neighbors in a global economy, how to combat terrorism, how to balance between markets and government, how to remain economically competitive, protect our environment, eradicate poverty, and make health care more affordable. And the upcoming state legislative session will deal with some, of, some questions that will remain with us for the foreseeable future. How do we have sustainable budgets with increasing public demands? What about marriage equality? What about education reform? Now, I started out just there with some bold questions um, because I was once advised that I should do such things. Uh, when I was running for the legislature in 2010 uh, in my landslide race, uh, Slade Gorton was kind enough to speak at a fundraiser for me. And I began my speech with a list of thank yous and acknowledgments. And after I'd finished speaking, Slade pulled me aside and said to me, always begin a speech with a bold statement or question. They'll forgive you for not starting with the thank yous. <laughs> so I've tried to practice that. <laughs> and today's program is about lessons like that one and others from Slade Gorton. But first, I will mention some acknowledgments I want to mention one elected official who's uh, in the room, uh, and that is uh, Mark Melosha, state representative from the uh, Federal Way area. And also we have Thurston County Auditor Kim Wyman. And uh, any other elected officials in the room here? And we have a city councilman here as well, Steve Durai. And um, I also want to mention John Hughes, who planned on being with us today but could not. And um, be because of, and Tony. Ellensburg City Council, just newly elected to the Ellensburg City Council, Tony Aronica. Uh, John Hughes had planned to be with us, uh, and he had some personal uh, concerns he needed to, to take care of, and, uh, but I, I want to mention that he is a veteran journalist who spent years at the Aberdeen Daily World. He was hired by Secretary of State Sam Reed as the state's historian for the Legacy Project to record the stories of our great Washingtonians. And John and I met for lunch in Olympia last year, and uh, we formed an instant friendship. And I think we sat there for two hours talking about our state's political history. And I uh, have, consider him a first-class biographer. He wrote a biography of uh, former Governor Booth Gardner, and now a, a magisterial biography of um, Slade. And I hope you uh, will buy a copy on your way out tonight. <coughs> I also want to thank Steve Burai and Bruce Chapman uh, for their support of this project and uh, making this possible. And I want to mention also our advisory board members for the new Center for Civic Leadership. Some who are here, and if you're here, if you'd stand, please do. Uh, Dr. Michael Allen, Professor of History at the University of Washington. Steve Burai, President of the Discovery Institute. Uh, Dr. Jeff Kane from American Philanthropic and Paulsbo. Bruce Chapman uh, from the Discovery Institute. Reed Davis, uh, Chair of the Political Science and Geography Department at Seattle Pacific, Trent England, Vice President of Policy at the Freedom Foundation, uh, Dr. Robert Kaufman, Professor of, uh, at Pepperdine University and the biographer of Henry M. Jackson, um, Slade Gordon, and um, also the Honorable Mary Ellen McCaffrey, who's a former legislator and an author of her own book about uh, state history, uh, Ralph Monroe, former Washington State Secretary of State, Representative Kevin Parker from the 6th Legislative District in Spokane, uh, Former State Senator George Scott, who is also a historian. Dr. Andrew Tatey, Professor of English at Seattle University. And uh, Dr. John West of the Discovery Institute. And thank you all. So why do we need a program on civic leadership? Well, for a few reasons. The first is that uh, many young people in the Puget Sound region are looking for ways to make a difference and become leaders. And I become distinctly aware of this as a young person myself in public life as I have opportunities to interact with young professionals and college students. They call us the millennial generation, and we haven't really had time to prove ourselves yet, but we have big aspirations. And you combine that with a history of big aspirations that is uh, notable in this region, and that's a powerful combination. 
there's this great desire that is absolutely radiant in this room tonight to do great things for the communities in which we've been blessed to live. We feel this not only as an ambition, but as a responsibility. And if our generation is going to be any good at leading, we must study how to do that. We must learn from previous generations, and we must form friendships that last through the years. A second reason why we need to focus on civic leadership is because of a certain breakdown in that type of leadership. We've delegated many of the tasks of traditional community leadership to highly trained and specialized bureaucrats. This has come both with benefits and costs. The benefits are that human problems can actually be addressed with some effectiveness on a large scale uh, by experts in centralized agencies. The costs are to relationships. Policies take the place of human relationships. Leaders become accustomed to thinking about regulatory solutions and bureaucratic solutions instead of community-based leadership where people can work together to solve their own problems. And the decentralized network of families, neighborhoods, businesses, houses of worship, and private associations of all kinds, I think, is capable of doing far more than we sometimes think. And I would argue that a strong community with all of the free institutions that make it up is a heck of a lot better at loving and caring for people than any government bureaucracy ever was. The third reason why this program is important is the civic tradition of which we are part. We are inheritors of an experiment in self-government, as the founders of the country called it. And all of history should teach us to be grateful for that. Every generation must do, is, must do its part to continue this tradition, and so we are here today. Here in downtown Seattle, we're reminded of our own part in that tradition. Many in this room have, have done and are doing what they can to make the best of this experiment, whether you're in business, whether you're in education or religion or media or public service. I myself am conscious of carrying on a tradition greater than myself. I recently learned that I sit as a seat on the state house floor that was once occupied 50 years ago by a state representative named Slade Gorton. And since we're about to go back into a legislative session, I'm planning to bring something down with me to put on my desk. Um, if you study the book by John Hughes, you will discover a man who has grappled, like few others in his time, with the greatest uh, questions of political and civic life. How do you order a good society? What kind of leadership is necessary? What kind of character is necessary? And in Slade Gorton, you'll find a man whose life is devoted to making a difference for Washington State. I, I'm speaking in the present tense here because he's still doing this. And uh, without him, our part of the country would be very different. Seattle would be very different. He has left a mark on the biggest institutions around here, the Seattle Mariners, Microsoft, Boeing, the tribes, the environmental movement, the timber industry. I should mention the Discovery Institute. He's on the board. In these things, he's been at times controversial always resolute, always just, always the smartest guy in the room. And his public career spans more than half a century. He was elected to the legislature in 1956, where he was the architect of the most successful Republican governing majority in state history. He served for 12 years as attorney general and argued 14 cases before the Supreme Court. He did an impossible thing in 1980 by unseating uh, the unseatable Warren Magnuson from his Senate seat, in which he, had, in which he then served for 18 years. He became one of the most respected statesmen of his generation, an intellectual power in the Republican majority of the 1990s. He continued his service thereafter as a member of the 9-11 Commission, and his continuing contributions to Washington are too numerous to count. There are two moments on the floor of the U.S. Senate that I want you to imagine. The first is um, in the fall of 1990, and it was originally not to be on the Senate floor, it was to be delivered before the Congress of Estonia, the very first session of the first Congress of Estonia. And this was arranged through an Estonian connection in Seattle. And the Soviets would not grant him passage, so he taped the speech on the U.S. Senate floor, and it was airmailed to Estonia. They set aside a, an empty chair in his honor as the speech was played uh, on a video screen. And in that speech, he talked about the essential elements of life in a free society. It will be essential reading, I think, in, in this particular program as it unfolds for all young leaders. 
who participate in the leadership roundtable that we're putting together, and there's applications to that program uh, on your seats. The second uh, occasion on the Senate floor is something that I learned about from a column by Peggy Noonan. And this was written when, when Slade uh, left his time in the US Senate 11 years ago. And she wrote this in the Wall Street Journal about some of the extraordinary tributes that were made by Slade's colleagues on the floor of the Senate. And I just want to read you a couple of paragraphs from that column. Over and over Thursday, the speakers spoke about two things. Because Mr. Gorton was wise and calm and highly intelligent, he was listened to. And because, and because he wasn't a showboat, he was respected. He wouldn't just pop off with a statement and hope to get credit for it. He was the last to run for the microphones, though he wasn't above noticing who did. <laughs> he spoke on the floor less often than some other senators. He spoke in private councils. He probably authored fewer bills, but shaped more law through advice and addendum. In all of the praise, you could hear the sound of an institution defining itself, showing through what it said, what it values and honors. I think it was saying this, says Peggy Noonan. In the clamor of big egos bumping into daily events that is Congress, we do notice who gets things done, who really works, who really thinks, who contributes, who has a long-term historical view, who is a patriot, who doesn't care who gets credit, who will quietly counsel and help you with your problem and not capitalize on it or use it against you, who stands not only for the party, but the country, and not only for the job, but for the institution, the Senate, this august chamber, which can actually make a difference in people's lives and which is a strong and necessary element in our republic. Well, I don't think I need to say much more. Slade is going to talk for about 15 minutes about his leadership lessons, and then I'll follow up with some questions, and finally, we'll open it up to your questions. So I introduce to you the smartest man in the state, a great Washingtonian and a great statesman, Slade Gorton. Sorry about that. <laughs> In 50 years, one promise I have never seen in any political handout is, if you elect me, I will be a good follower. <laughs> I'll follow the party line. I'll follow thus and such another person who is a leader. In fact, uh, if you read uh, the political literature, you will find that there are 98 leaders in the State House of Representatives and 435 in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., by their own description. And I'm not really here to criticize that kind of promise because at one level, that is actually true. Each one of those elected officers and the members of the city council and other positions here is in fact a leader in his or her own jurisdiction and community. Uh, people will come and listen to that person speak. They may or may not agree, but that leadership is there you know, by reason you know, of having been elected. Now that kind of leadership is there in positions in which elections are not formal uh, or uh, civic uh, organizations, all kinds of organizations, there's almost always someone to whom others look for some kind of guidance uh, whose views, if not always agreed to, are at least weighed carefully. What are the characteristics? I, I, I think one of the principal characteristics uh, <coughs> is that they have worked hard, that they've studied, that they have some idea about what they're talking, uh, uh, that they have more knowledge on the subject matter of the organization than does anyone else or almost anyone else in, in their audience. I can't think of anything more important for any one of you as you start down that road to prepare yourself so that when you walk into an audience of this size or half of this size or four times this size, you're reasonably confident that you know as much or more about the subject you're going to bring up as any other person in the room. And if you have that degree of confidence when you go in, you also need to know 
that there is very likely someone there who's going to ask you a question to which you don't know the answer. And you need to be confident enough under those circumstances to say that you don't know the answer, but that you'll find it out, and if the person will identify them himself or herself, you'll get back to them. I'll, uh, you know, I'll give you my best example. Uh, when I was first running for the United States Senate against Warren Magnuson, uh, sort of at the last minute, I got a very serious primary opponent in Lloyd Cooney, who was the president and the five-day-a-week editorialist uh, on, uh, on Cairo TV and was a really serious, uh, serious opponent. And we had a very large meeting, a quasi-debate, in front of the Washington State Dental Society. There were probably 600 people in the room, and each of us gave, got to give a short opening statement. And then there was a question period, and, and, and uh, the first question I'd answer first, and he'd respond, and then he'd answer first, and I'd respond. And we got about two-thirds of the way through one. Someone in the back of the room asked me a question about an obscure federal dental program that I had <laughs> never heard of. <laughs> For about half a second, I'm saying, can I fake it? <laughs> Decided no, and said, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know about the program. But if you'll write it down and give me your name, I'll get back to you. Lloyd Cooney got to speak up after me, and he said, damn. He said, I thought Slade was going to give one of his encyclopedic answers, and I could just agree with him, and he's absolutely failed me. <laughs> Which was a terrific answer you know, for him to have given you know, under the circumstances there. So, you know, a high degree of self-confidence in front of an audience is a very, very important uh, you know, quality. And that simply comes from having worked diligently uh, at whatever it is, whatever the subject is, in which you're attempting to <coughs> provide leadership. And the same thing holds true inside a legislative body, of course, as well. Uh, Hans has uh, been through only one session in the State House of Representatives, but I am certain that he has learned the lesson that, uh, that the other members of that body cannot hide their true characters. You are under such pressure under circumstances like that in such a body that what you really are comes out very, very quickly. And the members know who the workhorses are and who the show horses are <laughs> extremely well. And they know who they're going to listen to. And <laughs> leadership there, real leadership there, is, is spread out. Some people may know tax authority. Some people may know communications authority. Some people may know two or three things really very well. But the function of leadership, once you're in among your equals in any kind of formal body, like a legislature or anything <laughs> like it, is who do other people look to when a particular subject comes up? Even in our extremely partisan and divisive uh, you know, <coughs> political world today, that is true with the overwhelming majority of issues that never get discussed <coughs> in the newspapers or on television. The bill after bill after bill that uh, is required uh, <coughs> to run a free and a constantly changing society. The members <coughs> of the body itself know which other members know what they're talking about with respect to their issues. And they are willing to follow them under those circumstances. They won't advertise it when they come home and, and run for office the next time around. But in getting <coughs> the business of the body accomplished, that is where leadership is, is shown. And if Representative X <coughs> will be known as an expert on one subject, Representative Y on another. And, you know, and so on down the line. Second, another major element of that is, of course, always to tell the truth. You, know, <clears throat> you can probably fool another member once, but it'll never happen a second time. Uh, <clears throat> being, 
held in high regard uh, with respect to integrity, uh, with respect to being able to make the best argument for the position with which you disagree and say why yours is better is, is of absolutely vital importance. <coughs> we talk a great deal and we talk fairly properly, uh, rightly, uh, in our society about the importance of education, just education in general. Mostly now, we talk about it with respect to what profession a given individual is going to be and are, are we educating our children well enough to be engineers and mathematicians and the like. But education is important, vitally important, in connection with leadership. Knowledge is power, uh, and that power is what gives people the ability to provide uh, you know, real leadership uh, in, a, in a political situation. The best way to start <coughs> is to pick out a candidate, I think, speaking as a politician, you know, a candidate on whose, uh, <coughs> on whose campaign to work, observing how the candidate provides leadership to the people who are providing support, to observe how the candidate reacts under pressure how the candidate answers hostile questions, how the candidate deals with an unfriendly uh, you know, audience. There is nothing like the power of example to say, I think I could do that better. And then finding a situation in which you can prove uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that, you, that you can do that better. And I guess I would have to say, this now being an election year, that you can do that better if you're starting out in politics, in working for a candidate for an office that's close enough to you so that you're going to see a lot of the candidate. You know, we all, you know, we spent a lot of time on television on Tuesday night watching the results of the yeah, Iowa caucuses. But if you work for a presidential candidate, you may be in one rally when he, the, that candidate shows up here in the state of Washington. But you're never really going to learn anything about what the campaign was like. Pick candidates to work for where you're going to be able to see the candidate in action, where you're going to be able to express your own views to the candidate or listen to why it is that the candidate is running for the office that that, that, that person uh, uh, seeks. Uh, that's uh, you know, the, the best way you know, to learn what leadership is truly like is to watch someone attempting to exercise that leadership in a real situation in, in, in one's own life. And Lord knows in the year 2012, there will be plenty of opportunities to do that. Some of you will be candidates or candidates in the, in the audience here. Most of you will not be. But the very fact that you're here shows that you're interested in the subject. Participate in this year's campaigns. Learn what leadership is like from the ground floor. And learn that to be a leader, you're going to have to know your subject. Now, that's not a whole 15 minutes, but Hans has got all kinds of questions for me. And I'm every bit as anxious as you are to hear them. So, <laughs> All right, well, um, I do have a great list of questions. Some, some I've asked you before, because I interviewed you uh, for a paper I wrote last year for, <laughs> for grad school. Um, <laughs> so I already know the answer. Yeah, he is young. <laughs> like, you, you said that I should know the answer to the question before I ask. <laughs> You're an avid reader. What book or books have most changed your life? One. During uh, World War II, and then just 10 or 15 years ago, when I went to uh, Yugoslavia, Rebecca West's Black Lamb and Gray Falcon doesn't create much uh, <laughs> response <laughs> to here yeah, yeah, in the audience, but it is a wonderful reflection you know, on pre-war Europe, uh, on Yugoslavia, yeah, and on the cost of freedom. Who are heroes that have inspired you in public service and in your life? Oh, that, uh, you know, that, 
many of the presidents and leaders of the United States, F. Washington and Lincoln, of course, Alexander Hamilton. I'm not a great admirer of Jefferson, I must say. Uh, Why not? Uh, Teddy, yeah, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. I just finished Why not the, third, the third volume. Well, Jefferson did two really terrific things. He wrote the Declaration of Independence and he bought Louisiana and he was wrong on almost everything else. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt, as I say, I just finished the third volume of the great Teddy Roosevelt uh, you know, biography. And anyone just has to shake his head. When you, when you talk about leadership, there is the ultimate example. <laughs> How did Walter Judd influence you in your public service? Well, that's, see, now you do, you, you, you do remember your earlier interview. Uh, when I was a freshman or a sophomore in high school in Evanston, Illinois, in a huge high school, 3,200 students in the student body, early in World War II, we had as a speaker a freshman member of Congress from Minnesota. Why he came to our high school in Illinois, I will never know. He was a physician. Uh, he was a Presbyterian minister, and he had been a medical missionary in China until he was driven out by the Japanese at, at the beginning of World War II. And he came home really to spread the alarm you know, about what was wrong with the world and how it was our duty to set it aright and was elected to Congress uh, for that purpose and talked about leadership uh, and about public service and about elective office. And I think I was probably 14 at the time and I walked out of that big assembly saying, when I grow up, I want to be Walter Judd. And I managed to tell him so. He was in his 90s and in a retirement home in Washington, D.C. in my first year in the Senate. Uh, and uh, I told him that he had started me on that road. <laughs> I, in my short time in politics, I have learned that friendship is the most powerful force in politics. And, uh, and I can think of no better example of that than the story of you and Joel Pritchard and Dan Evans and Charles Moriarty as roommates together and young colleagues together With in the legislature. Sa Sally was our house mother. <laughs> and Sally, <laughs> we were, Sally Gordon. We were just married and she was pregnant with our first child and the other three either were unmarried or didn't bring their families to Olympia. And uh, there were four of us uh, living a little more than half a mile from the Capitol in a very tiny Republican minority, smaller than yours by quite a, you know, you know, by quite a number. And uh, we spent our evenings plotting how there were going to be more of us and what we were going to do when we were in a majority. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that carry on through the years? What was that bond? Well, it took 10 years before we ever got a majority, <laughs> I will say. But by that time, Dan Evans was governor. And not too long after that, uh, you know, Joel Pritchard you know, was, was a member of Congress. But uh, uh, you know, those were wonderful days in which we found uh, in Olympia in that first term uh, the uh, Republican Party to be almost without any discernible leadership. And as a consequence, uh, anyone who had any ideas about uh, uh, how change should be accomplished in the state uh, and in the party had a great opportunity to do so. Hmm. What was your proudest achievement in the U.S. Senate? That's a question that I've never been able to answer uh, <laughs> adequately because every day was a new day you know, with a, a different challenge. And as you know, in 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 any legislative body, in any fairly large body of people, you never do anything by yourself. Uh, you know, you build coalitions, you affect, uh, you know, you affect the course of debate, uh, and uh, um, you just can't say, <coughs> well, I did this or that. You know, I, I, I passed a particular tax bill. Uh, some, of, some things you just sort of fall into. Uh, when I was first elected in 1980, Republicans won a majority in the United States Senate for the first time in, in a generation. Uh, uh, we picked our committees and then our subcommittees by seniority. Uh, I got the last choice of a chairmanship uh, on the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, and it happened to be on the subcommittee on Merchant Marine. Now, I can assure you, 
I never had a single question or a single thought about the Merchant Marine while I was running for the United States Senate. But it was a time that a 50-year-old law had to be changed relating to a Merchant Marine. So for three years, I made myself an expert on laws relating to the United States Merchant Marine and ultimately passed a significant reform bill on the subject. And I never thought about the subject since. <laughs> <laughs> Having gone on to, to, you know, to better subcommittees. But I guess in a sense, that's an illustration of what I said here earlier, uh, no one else was particularly interested in the subject, or very few, half a dozen members of both houses of Congress. And as a consequence, ending up knowing more about the subject than anyone else meant that, you know, that I wrote the new law. Now, that's certainly not my proudest accomplishment, but it's one of the things that I can say probably would not have happened and would not have happened in the same way had I not been there and just by accident gotten that, uh, that particular matter. From the point of view of uh, my contributions to this community, baseball may rank number one, <laughs> which was not a part of the definition either of the Attorney General's job or the United States Senator's job, but turned out to be, it turned out to be a part of both. Uh, one year in the mid-1980s, the uh, budget that was passed by Congress and followed ended up having my name on it after having five previous budgets defeated uh, you know, before, before time. In the last two years, no budget resolution has passed the Congress at all. It's that, uh, it's, it's that, the, the, you know, it's that dysfunctional. But there are dozens of other uh, you know, instances or times in which I had, uh, had an impact, no one of which would be something that I would say was number one or a signal achievement. You talk about the importance of expertise and getting onto a committee like the Merchant Marine Subcommittee and, and making a difference there. Are today's legislators in, in an age of larger government than we've ever experienced before in our country, are today's legislators adequately prepared to wade into that and uh, be effective in that setting? They're overtaxed. Uh, there's, there's no question about it. I, I'm sure that I, I, I know that's true in Olympia, too. But uh, in Congress, uh, there are far too many subjects. There are too many subjects every day for any for any individual to be a real expert on you know on on you know, on, on any one of them, uh, and the, the system is dysfunctional. There's probably there's probably too little real debate in both houses. Uh, I'm very disturbed about the fact that most of the debates in the Senate now take place not on the substance of a particular subject or a bill, but on the question of whether to take the bill up at all. Uh, and, uh, uh, and far too much of, of the time in the Senate and even some in the House is taken up you know, you know, with quorum calls you know, without a real debate uh, uh, on the issues to which the public can respond. And part of that is, uh, is can't be cured. Uh, the society gets bigger and more complicated uh, you know, every year. Part of it has to do with the fact that, that many of the rules of debate are anachronistic and, and uh, get in the way of, of having major, thoughtful, and significant uh, uh, debates uh, in the way they may have happened 100 years or so ago. Do members of Congress spend far too much time fundraising? And how did you deal with that in your career? I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I don't really buy that. Uh, critique. Of course members spend time fundraising, but when you say uh, ex the candidate so-and-so you know, raised ten million dollars and that meant he or she had to be working so many hours, that really isn't true. A lot of that work, a lot of that work is done by others. And I'll tell you, when you're in the Senate or when you're in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., uh, you're deferred to and treat it as something extra special, and your senator this or congressman that. It's damn good for those people to have to go out and ask people to, to write checks to them and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and to support them. It's the only way that any kind of humility is going to be brought into their lives. <laughs> 
you spent a number of years as a minority legislator, both in the State House as well as in the U.S. Senate. And I wonder, uh, is it possible for a minority party or a minority legislator to be a leader? Uh, yeah, I had every possible combination in the United States Senate in my 18 years. Uh, in a majority with a, with a uh, president of my party, in a minority with the president of my party, and in both a majority and a minority with the president of the other party. <laughs> Not to mention the combinations in, in, in the House itself. Probably the United States Senate gives more scope for that than any of the other, than either the House or either House of our state legislature. Uh, simply because uh, of the requirement for a supermajority in, in, in a number of cases. And to deal with these at least middle level bills and even third level bills, uh, yeah, there is a very large ability of minority uh, members who pay a lot of attention to a particular issue and who become recognized as being both thoughtful and objective on those issues uh, to provide real leadership uh, in, in passing bills. And we've seen in Olympia, at least, where you are, at least in the state senate, uh, this very year in the senate, which is a closer numerical division than the House, that the budget could not be passed without some leadership from some of the Republicans, just simply because they, the, if the majority party is not absolutely monolithic, and in the United States Senate, if it doesn't have 60 members who are absolutely monolithic, they've got to go to the minority. There's that great story of the early 60s when the minority Republicans teamed up with the majority, uh, with a small minority of the Democrats to form a working majority to oust the Speaker of the House, John O'Brien. And you were a big part of that. Well, that's a part of my life that's, that's, that I'm just finishing up on now. A, a large element in our successful desire to create that coalition had to do with redistricting when the legislature did it and when the legislature was on a court order to redistrict. But the Democratic Party had been in a majority for a long time by the early 1960s and had really broken apart. And uh, uh, ultimately, seven Democrats in the House joined with 48 Republicans to oust the speaker, to elect one of those Democrats as a puppet speaker, effectively, and uh, uh, to, to it, it's a very interesting challenge to run a body of, nine, of 99 with a majority of 48. But that's what happened. I was the chairman of the Committee on Elections. It took three years to pass that redistricting bill. You think we took a long time this time around. It took three full years then. Um, I guess that's all I had on, on my questions. I want to take questions from the audience sure. now. And uh, we have a microphone to go around. Do you want me to do that? Other questions? Oh, there's Bruce. Oh, Bruce, <laughs> he, he can speak without a microphone. <laughs> All this history is very interesting, uh, Senator, but the fact of the matter is you've also been involved in something that's very topical, which is on a lot of people's minds, which is redistricting of the state of Washington. And um, some people think you really sort of had your way with that, with that crowd and that whole process. Would you like to describe uh, how the, the, the redistricting has come out and how satisfied you are with it? And, what you think, as a practical matter, it's done now, right? Well, What's if I weren't satisfied with it, I wouldn't have signed the bill, but neither would either, either of the other three. Uh, and uh, um, I, I do think that I can say that now, unlike the situation in the 1960s, we have the best or one of the two or three best systems of redistricting, <clears throat> both for our congressional district lines and our legislative lines in the country. And the reason it's that good is that it's absolutely evenly divided, two Republicans and two Democrats with no tiebreaker. In states where there's a tiebreaker, the two parties talk past one another, each one presents a plan to the, to the tiebreaker and one loses. Uh, in, in, in our case, in all three cases in which uh, we've done it by, uh, you know, by commission, 
We've had districts that are more regular in appearance and a fairer division between the two parties than, uh, than, than almost anyone else uh, in the country. And I think, uh, you know, I was going through my papers today, <coughs> over 80% over of the people in the state, of all of you here, will reside in the same legislative district now that you did in the past. No district has fewer than 50% of its uh, former, you know, you know, of its former members, I think all four of us agreed that we weren't picked in order to to reverse the results of previous elections. We were picked to make the next set of elections more fair, and to a certain extent, a bit more competitive. I think we will have a few more competitive uh, you know, legislative districts uh, uh, than we had in the past. And of course, the one that's gotten the most attention is the fact that the census gave us a 10th congressional district. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I did reach my own goals in that. The 10th congressional district, which actually has the number one, uh, will, I think, be the, perhaps the most competitive congressional district in the United States. Uh, by all of the voting tests that both parties applied to it, it comes out as an almost dead even tie. Uh, if it's 50.2 percent and 0.02 rather percent on either in, uh, on either side, it'll it uh, will be well. So if you live in the new first congressional district, you'll have 15 candidates to choose among it when the primary comes around. I suspect <laughs> all kinds of uh, interesting elements to work, but uh, ultimately. All four of us were satisfied <coughs> with the results, and I think the results are fair. Good evening, Senator. Um, I'm a political science professor at a local community college, and anytime anyone finds out that I teach political science, I get the, oh, I'm very sorry um, <laughs> look. And I'm, I'm actually getting used to it, and I hear it a lot from my students that this class is a waste of my time, my American government class in particular. You mentioned earlier that you think the fact that the Senate and the House spend so much time in quorum call and procedural matters is leading to the public having little to respond to when it comes to understanding. And we know that the American public is becoming increasingly disenchanted with Congress. They love their member of Congress, they hate the institution of Congress. I'm curious what you think the solution is. How do we get the American public re-engaged with those institutions that are making these decisions that are so important to our daily life? Is it the responsibility of the institution or is it the responsibility of the public? Well, ultimately, it's the responsibility of the public, <coughs> but a great deal of it is the responsibility of, uh, you know, of the institution as well. Uh, the, 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 I can speak more and uh, with a greater degree of expertise for the United States Senate than I can uh, you know, for any other body, but you know, the, the right of a minority to slow things down, the right of a minority <coughs> to filibuster, I've always thought was very important that uh, concurrent majorities for really important issues were, uh, you know, were vital to the proper governance of, uh, you know, of the country. But even, you know, I guess even when I started in the 1980s, uh, the use of that right was much more rare than it is now. Now it is ordinarily being, it is being regularly carried out on what's called the motion to proceed, that is to take up a bill in the first place or to take up a nomination in the first place. And presidential nominations to whom, to, to whom no one really rejects are held up for ancillary issues. You know, this won't happen until, uh, you know, un, until thus and such happens. And uh, even, even when there are 60 votes to break a filibuster, a minor bill is still going to take a full week or maybe two weeks to pass. And no majority leader can afford to spend two weeks on a bill that isn't of really major national importance. Um, uh, I would, personally, I would abolish the right to filibuster the motion to proceed. I let the majority leader bring up whatever subject he wants and require the super vote majority to be there in order to pass it in the ultimate analysis. That I, I wouldn't get away with. I also had a view that really is, I guess, outside the Constitution on, you know, on, on confirmations. Uh, the, the phrasing of the Constitution's by and with the consent of the Senate is the same for any officer subject to con confirmation. My own personal view 
uh, was to vote to confirm for all practical purposes anyone the president nominated for a job that served at the president's pleasure. Uh, it was going to be gone when the president was gone. Uh, but to say that uh, when, uh, on the other side, when the president was appointing someone for life, i.e. a judge, my, my, my uh, in, uh, uh, opinion on that individual was just as important as the president was. And if uh, it says advice and consent, my view is if my advice wasn't sought, my consent wouldn't be given. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that, the, that the president owed it with respect to judges particularly. To, to, to consult significantly you know, with the Senate before nominations were made. Now, as I say, that was a, uh, there, there were a number of other members who felt the same way, but obviously not enough. I, I hope one day, very soon, hopefully by the next Congress, that uh, issues like that, uh, that I do think have a great deal to do with the people's view of the way our business is conducted, will be taken up. Okay, well let's uh, give uh, both Hans Eiger and Senator Gorton a hand.